We took a break for the month of Elul, and we've been doing Psalm 27. And we've we've and uh, I like to say that this class is like the slow food movement. We take a lot of digressions. Uh, we study a lot of different aspects of things that come up because we've encountered them in the Psalms. For instance, this week, I learned about the M dash, which I never knew what it was. And um, uh, we have a Facebook group for the Psalms class and people post uh, various things. We study archeology, span we study linguistics. And this summer, because so many of our members were eager to get deeper into the Hebrew of the text, we offered Hebrew classes for people from the very, from very, 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 very beginner to people who had some Hebrew background. 90 people this summer at CBST studied Hebrew uh, mostly twice a week for those eight weeks, and many have continued in various kinds of study groups. And it's been very exciting to see some of our first time readers, even to be able to read a psalm out loud in class has been very, very exciting. And so Hebrew has become an important part of our conversation. And I try, when I teach, we do different kinds of levels of engagement with the language. And uh, for each psalm, class participants at, write their own version of each psalm. And so we've created this very beautiful, moving, what will be, I think, one of the most important sacred texts coming out of this pandemic uh, of the psalms written in this period by members of the class. So that's a little bit of an overview. We start each class. We have a wonderful group of musicians in the class. And so a different musical person either sings or plays an instrument. And tomorrow we're gonna to even include movement and dance by one of our members. But today, um, uh, Adria Benjamin, who is a violist, uh, will play, um, will play. Adria, we're all yours. Rabbi, can you see the screen, Lador Vador? Uh, I see a black screen, yes. There we go, I can see it now. Adrian. Uh -huh. Wow, Adria, gorgeous. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> um, and it was so much fun having Adria uh, play last week at, during services, uh, the Altaster uh, that we, we were studying in Psalm 27. So again, I just wanna welcome everybody to our class today. And we have some guests here um, to join us for this special class. And we've done a lot of different special topics in our is this six months we've now been studying? 
uh, uh, so one of the issues that has come up, so I want to just welcome those of you who are here for the first time just for this topic. You are super welcome. Uh, we, you can put things in the chat. And then if you have a question, we ask you to raise your hand electronically. Harold Levine is here as, and he is a wonderful board member of CBST and uh, the TA for the class. And he and I will, since I'm not going to be presenting, we'll keep an eye on the chat, but we're going to that way let our speaker just speak and not watch the chat. And then we'll, at a certain point, ask for questions, okay? And if you're interested in continuing in the Psalms class, everybody's welcome, whatever your background, I can promise you. In the current class, uh, we have people from every possible Jewish background and some who are not Jewish. We have a member of our class who comes every day from Bulgaria. Darina, are you here today? If Darina is here, who comes in from Bulgaria every day, not Jewish, who's added immeasurably to our class, and we're so happy to have her. We have people with no Hebrew backgrounds, people who come from like uh, Shari and Debbie, who both um, have been Orthodox and are fluent Hebrew speakers. And we have Israelis in the class like Yael Bat Chava, who grew up without any uh, access to religious texts and for whom studying Psalms is a new thing but brings a great Israeli uh, perspective. We have people of all different political perspectives, all different religious perspectives, all different sexual orientations and gender identities. And we have about 80 or 90 people every day. So it's, it's quite a, a journey we're taking together. So welcome to all of those of you who are new. Happy if you're just here for today. If you wanna continue with us, uh, please know you're very, very welcome to. It's a uh, unusual way to study. So um, one of the issues that comes up whenever one begins to study the Hebrew language, whether it's liturgically or in sacred text or in uh, speaking Hebrew, is the very gendered nature of the language. And that's come up a lot in our studying of the text and how to deal with God, the name of God, and how to deal with the genderedness of God and how to deal with genderedness of the language altogether. So those kinds of questions have come up periodically. And as the class has gotten more sophisticated about Hebrew, the questions have gotten more sophisticated about the problems that Hebrew presents, especially because for English speakers, uh, we're lazy a little bit because we haven't had to confront some of the issues that are the course of the language. So I am thrilled because I invited my very good friend and one of the, really, I have to tell you, say one of the two smartest people in the world that I know, and I know a lot of smart people, and she's one of the two smartest that I know. Who's and the first? She, what? No, there are two of you. There are two people I think are the two smartest people. It's not one of you is more smart than the other. It's the two of you are equally smart. Chai Feldblum is the other. The two of you are the smartest people I know in very, very, very different ways. Um, and... Noah has had a very moving career. Interesting, we've heard a little bit that after uh, Noah left the army, she was in the high tech industry in Israel, which a lot of smart people coming out of the army do in Israel. And she left that pretty quickly though, when she wanted to do uh, work of deeper meaning. And she took her skills as a computer um, software code, blah, 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 genius. She ran a program for Palestinian and uh, Jewish kids to develop connections through technology, teaching coding to a very special program of Palestinian and Israeli Jewish kids. And then she was the um, director of the, uh, the LGBT Center in Jerusalem, which has Palestinian and Jewish kids of all ages, and she was first the chair of the board, which is when I first met Noah. And um, uh, work, we worked together on the World Pride. And we brought a CBST delegation, actually, at that time, which was quite an experience. I don't know if anybody here was on that delegation. Maybe Shep, were you on that delegation? Or Judy Hollander? I don't remember. And a very famous movie yeah, was. was made about World Pride, which features Noah. Um, the death threats against her were so severe, she had to have security guards and bodyguards uh, because of the ultra-Orthodox attacks on her. And um, she did the unthinkable, which is that she actually got the right-wing Muslim, the right-wing Christian, and the right-wing Jewish community to work together in their hatred of LGBT people. They actually had a a press conference where these 
really despicable people from all of the faith traditions of Jerusalem who never talked to each other got together in order to condemn Noah Satat and the Jerusalem open house. So she withstood as a young woman, tremendous and very, very ugly pressure. And then she's got, she went on to become a rabbi in Israel, which like um, what you said, Yael, Noah says uh, that, you know, her parents could deal with her being a lesbian, but becoming a rabbi just was a shame for the family. You know, that in an Israeli family, there's, you know, it's a, in a secular Israeli family, it's a terrible shame. Anyway, and then, uh, so she's now a rabbi in Jerusalem and she runs the Religious Action Center um, of Israel, which works on anti-racism and pro-Palestinian and anti-violence um, and does a lot of work in trying to reduce racism in Israeli society and to uh, promote uh, gender equality and fight for all the good things that we all love. Anyway, that's a, it's a, so Israel Religious Action Center, wonderful organization if you want to follow. And um, Noah was our Hebrew consultant for the CBST CDOR because, and one of the reasons I wanted her to talk today is to not only talk about the issues in modern Hebrew spoken language, but what's going on liturgically in the progressive parts of the Israeli progressive religious community about a language that we're dealing with um, in American Sidurim the progressive Jewish communities of Israel are dealing with in Israeli Hebrew. And um, I think Yael Kerry just joined. Yael, are you here? I think I just saw that uh, Rabbi Yael Kerry, who is also an Israeli uh, reformer. Oh, there's Yael Kerry. Is he Hi. 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 So I recently saw I, all of my <laughs> Hebrew I practice yeah. on Facebook. And I saw on Yael Carey's Facebook, maybe last week, Yael, that you wrote Elohim. Did you, you write that? Which is the name of God, Elohim, which American Jews are so familiar, and put it in the feminine. Yes. So that's how I learned what's going on in modern spoken Hebrew and in, <laughs> as I watch Facebook from my friends who are Israeli. So Mario and Yael, so happy to have you with us. And Yael is a great poet and a beautiful, a beautiful human being. And she's the rabbi in the north they live on a kibbutz in Rosh Hanikra in the very, very north of Israel, and she's the regional rabbi for the northern part of Israel, for the progressive uh, parts of Israel. So welcome to have you here. So I'm going to turn this over to Noah. And Noah, you tell us what you're going to do, and you get to speak, and then we'll ask questions. We're not going to interrupt you with a lot of questions now. We'll wait till you've had a chance to present for a little bit, okay? Perfect. So don't watch the chat. Don't watch the chat. I, I'll try. Okay, but uh, other people, if you have questions, put your questions in the chat. Yeah, please don't forget them. So hi, everybody. It's so great to see so many friends. I miss you so much. And seeing you uh, makes me uh, miss you even more. Um, and it's so wonderful that you're spending this time studying together. Um, and uh, what Rabbi Clambon forgot to mention is that CBSD was my inspiration to becoming a rabbi. So I'm deeply grateful to the congregation uh, for the significant, significant role you played in my journey. Um, and I think I want to start with, uh, um, Harold, can you help me share the screen? Hold on. There we go. Thank you. Um, um, so I think I want to start with a poem, and I heard that there are Hebrew speakers who can help me. So I'm, I want to share uh, a poem um, from a famous Israeli poet called Yonah Volach, uh, speaking about gender and Hebrew. Um, maybe Yael or some other, uh, Yael Bat Chava or some other Hebrew speakers want to uh, help me with reading, and then we'll switch to the English. I can do that. Yes, let's do it. Bishmot min yesh la anglit kol efsharuyot, kol ani befoal, hu kol efsharut bemin, vechol at hi ata, vechol ani hu blimin, ve en evdel ben at ve ata, 
וכל הדברים הם זה לא איש, לא אישה, לא צריך לחשוב לפני שמתייחסים למין. עברית היא סקס מניאקית. <laughs> עברית מפלה לרעה או לטובה, מפרגנת, נותנת פריבילגיות עם חשבון ארוך מהגלות. ברבים יש זכות קדימה להם עם הרבה דקות וסוד כמוס. ביחיד הסיכויים שווים. את יכולה... מי אומר שכלו כל הקיצים? עברית היא סקס מניאקית. Thank you, Yael. And let's, let's do the... the, the oh, sorry about that. Let's do the English. Can somebody read? I will read. Thank you. About pronouns and sex, English leaves its options open. In practice, each I has all the options. You is he or she. I is sexless. There's no difference, and all things are it. Not man, not woman. No need to think before relating to sex. Hebrew is a sex maniac. Hebrew discriminates for and against, is forgiving, gives privileges, with a big gripe from the exile. In plural, men have the right of way. It's a thin line. It's a big secret. It's the singular chances are equal. Who says it's a lost cause? Hebrew is a sex maniac, wants to know who's talking. Almost a mirror, almost a picture, forbidden by the Torah, at least, looks at, at least looking at sex, Hebrew peeks through the keyhole, as I did at you and your mother when you washed in the shed. Your mother had a big ass, but I never stopped thinking the days passed like showers. You remained a thin girl, soaping herself, After you, afterwards, you women plugged all the holes, plugged all the gaps. Hebrew peeks at you through the keyhole. The language sees you naked. My father didn't let me see. He turned his back when he peed. I never really saw him. He always hid his sex. The way the Hebrew plural hides a woman. The way an audience is masculine in Hebrew. The way the word word in Hebrew is masculine and feminine. There's nothing like these sweet things. Hebrew is Bathsheba, Bathsheba clean, a graven image, not forbidden, with tiny beauty marks and birthmarks. The older she gets, the more beautiful she is. Her judgment is sometimes prehistoric. This kind of neurosis is for her own good. Tell me in masculine, tell me in feminine. Every eye is childlike, an unfertilized egg. You can skip over sex, you can give up sex. Who can tell the sex of a baby chick? Man created by nature before a conjugated verb is planted in him. Memory is masculine, creates sexes. The offspring are the main thing because that's life. Hebrew is a sex maniac. And whatever you women say in a feminist complaint, searching for stimulation outside the language with an intonation that gives meaning to things, Signs just of male or female in a sentence will change sexual relations, make them strange, mark every female, a different mark for men when every verb and verb group are marked. What does man do to a woman? What does he get in return? What power does she exert over him? And what sign given to an object and to an abstract noun and particles? We'll get a sort of natural game, an emotional happening like a new forest. a game of universal natural forces determining all the particulars, universal signs for all events that may happen someday. Look what a body language has and what proportions love her now without cover of words. So Jona Volokh is a fantastic poet. Uh, she was born in uh, 1944 in Serbia and um, she died in 1985. She was one of those uh, revolutionary people Israeli poets. Her um, most famous and notorious poem was about using uh, tefillin for, um, for bondage. Um, and uh, there is a fantastic uh, documentary about her made by um, queer documentarist uh, Ya'il Keida, which I really, really recommend. She was a phenomenal, innovative um, poet. Um, but what she's saying and what the reality is, is that Hebrew um, makes gender appear much more quickly than, uh, than the uh, European languages. The, the same, what, what is true for Hebrew is also true for Arabic. Every object is gendered, 
every verb uh, in, in the present tense is, uh, is gendered, plural is gendered, I is, the word I is gendered, the word you is gendered, everything is gendered. Um, and it's really interesting to see the impact on society. I read uh, this morning about a study from the 80s that, saw, that demonstrated that Israeli children, Hebrew speaking Israeli children, um, recognized the gender of the speaker uh, much earlier than uh, English speaking children because you have to, do, to know it. So really what Yonav Olach is pointing to the, is that language um, both reflects reality and creates it. And the fact that Hebrew is so tremendously gendered um, it creates a difference in the way we think about ourselves. And if there's no way to think about I uh, in a non-binary way, that impacts everything. Um, also, uh, for instance, one of the uh, funny anecdotes of, um, of uh, children of lesbians is that boys often uh, use I pronouns in female when they start speaking because people talk to them in I pronouns and female then, and then they reflect that, that back and they adjust. But it's very, uh, the, the impact of the constant gendering of the language is intense. Um, the word I is not gender. I'm watching the chat, even though Rabbi Klein, but I'm not told me not to, but I'm, <laughs> I'm going to respond anyway. The word I is not gendered, but any verb that I conjugate after I is gendered. It's different for, I would say, I see different if I were uh, if, uh, as, as in female and in, in male. And every, my computer, the chair I'm sitting in, the window I'm looking at, everything is gendered. Every object has a gender attached to it. And, and there has been a lot of research saying, why is door uh, feminine and window masculine? Um, but that's the, that's the reality of Hebrew. Um, and that brings, so I'm gonna, now that we have a little bit of the scope of the problem, um, I'm gonna look at some of the solutions that are being um, done today in modern Hebrew and then look at the liturgy. Uh, the liturgical solutions. So in terms of um, the, uh, the modern Hebrew, there are two main issues that uh, happen here. One is a feminist issue, the fact that in every government forum and every formal address, women are sidelined. Um, uh, Knesset member Merav Michaeli, who is a very good friend of CBSD and has been many times, has really created a revolution in in Israeli politics by insisting to speak in female form, in plural. She recently form. posted, she, a lot of people in the class saw the uh, school post, she is the one who posted that uh, from a, uh, I think a middle school that had the uh, yeah. thing. That was her, that was Meirav Michaeli, who is, as Noah says, come to CBST many times. And this has been one of her big, Go ahead. So, so how are women included in the, um, in the public discourse is a, is a big question that's becoming mainstream in Israel and there are different solutions. Um, and, and then in the queer community, there are also a lot of questions um, around um, how do we reflect non-binary genders or how do we, how do we create a language around, around that? And I'm really curious, Leo, to go to the, the website that you posted and see um, uh, and see what you uh, what you've come up with. Um, but the Hebrew account Academy for uh, the, the the Academy for the Hebrew Language, which is an institution that was founded before the State of Israel was founded, um, uh, has five different solutions that they offer um, in terms of um, creating uh, creating more balance between the genders. So the first su suggestion that they're offering um, is only speaking in male plural. So instead of filling a form where uh, you have to fill, um, wh where the instructions are in singular male, they're suggesting putting it in plural male, which also includes women because uh, plural male also includes women. 
So that's kind of the least um, revolutionary suggestion. Many, many institutions have followed that. Um, the second type of uh, solution that requires more effort is creating completely different subtests of forms. This is only in writing for men and for women. So for instance, uh, in this uh, term in um, Tel Aviv University, every student could choose their pronouns and they would get uh, the, their tests in la of the language of the pronoun that they chose. It was, it was either he or she, it wasn't uh, anything plural, but, but they gave the students a choice. Uh, the driver's license, my driver's license says Shema Nahag, the name of the driver, the name of the male driver. Um, so now the DMV in Israel is manufacturing two types of driver's licenses, one in female and one in male. Um, and so that's a, that's a solution that requires a lot of effort, but I think that that is a way that um, people are um, starting to go. Another solution, just as I was walk, working on this, I got this um, um, this I, I, I'm sharing it. Hold on. This post from um, the Academy for Hebrew Language, and they're saying, Otanasilamitnadev, which is the president's uh, our president is not as bad as yours. The president's prize for volunteers used to be called meaning the president's prize for a male volunteer. And they're changing it to the, uh, to say, meaning the president's prize for volunteering. Uh, and that's also, for instance, what my, my bank is doing. They have reduced pronouns altogether and they're just using verbs. And so it's not conjugated, so it's not gendered. Um, and the last thing that uh, many, uh, all of the Israeli government is, uh, is committed to uh, and um, is saying in every form that even though the form is in male language, it refers, it refers to all genders, which, uh, which is kind of weak, but that's the, that's the legal uh, victory of Merav Michaeli saying, now, if you're only going to re relate to to, um, to to men, then you have to at least acknowledge that in um, in the way you refer to um, in in the beginning of your reference. So these are the five solutions that are ma are mainly about the inclusion of women in the public sphere. Um, in terms of queer existence, or in terms of um, non-binary uh, um, people, there are several things that people do. So first of all, um, the, um, the, the one of the issues is for people who, uh, who identify as non-binary is how do they conjugate words in the first, in the, fir in the present tense. Um, so some uh, queer people only use past and future. In the past and the future, uh, the verbs are non-gendered. So I can say, um, if I say, um, I'm looking out the window, that's either as a woman or as a man. But if I, I'm saying, in the future, that's uh, gender neutral. And if I'm saying, if I'm saying, in the past, that's also non-gendered. Um, so, so, so it's a cumbersome way to speak, but some people told me that they've adjusted to it completely uh, and that you actually don't need a present tense when you come to think about it. It's, very, it's a very revolutionary way to live. If everything is in the past and the future, there's no, nothing in the present. Um, and that, uh, that's one of the ways uh, for, uh, for non-binary people to refer to themselves. Another way is, uh, is intermittent, which is, for instance, what we do in our staff is to say, one time you use a verb in female and one time you use a verb in male, um, which is what I do for my staff when I speak in plural because most of my staff um, 
are women, and Mario is on my staff. Hey, Mario. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then, uh, um, and, and that's a way for many of the queer or non-binary people to, to speak about themselves in, in singular um, uh, form. And just to kind of, to exemplify the magnitude of the pro problem, you can't ask somebody, what's your preferred, uh, gen what's your preferred pronoun without assuming their gender? Uh, so, so there are sophisticated ways to asking that without referring to somebody's gender, but it's very, it's, the gender is everywhere in Hebrew. Um, one of the uh, ways that people uh, write and also sometimes speak uh, non-binary people is using both the, the, um, the gender, uh, is uh, mostly in the siyomat, in the ending of the word. So, and Leo mentioned that in the beginning that many non-binary people or queer communities use both the um, siyomat, both the ending for the male and the end ending for the female in every word that they use. It's, it's, an, it's an interesting experiment. In some queer communities, that's the language that is lived. I mean, there's no, it sounds a little bit awkward when you're a Hebrew speaker. So give some examples of that so people will hear that. Like, so. So, um, for instance, chaverimot uh, yekarimot, anachno yotzimot le seminar. A seminar yatchil. So it's like, it's the, it's every, every ending is both the, the female ending and the, the male ending. That's all, that can also be, in singular, uh, so it's but it's but it's it does not flow in Hebrew in the current Hebrew for many people. Um, so so in the queer community, it's very very common. I think that for people outside the community, it's uh, it sounds a. Uh, bit strange uh, at the moment. And that's similar to here, right? People, language changes and it takes a while for it to... Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Actually, there, there was a big, um, there's, a sh there's a show um, uh, uh, called the Yudim Ba'im. It's a satire, sh it's a Jewish satire sh show. And they have, uh, they had their, uh, uh, last week's episode was about um, the prophet Amos who is standing at the gates of the, the um, city of Jerusalem. And he's saying, the Assyrians are in, on the gates. They're coming to see us. And then the crowd is trying to correct his gender pronouns all the time. And he's there like, you're not using the right gender pronouns. Uh, so, so I think some people are frustrated <laughs> by, the, by the use of the language, but, uh, but I think it's definitely gaining, gaining ground. Um, uh, what other uh, queer people are doing is using plural. That's uh, that's also very common. Um, and I think I think that the most um, the most common way is intermittent. I see that we are almost running out of time, so I just um, yeah, tell us a little bit about liturgy and tell us a yeah, little so bit I'm, about yeah. Like, so I'm going to share yeah. some of the so the um, reform movement in Israel is now. Um, uh, putting together a new sidu. We've been working on it for eight years and you're getting to see it before it's even in print. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot this. So this is the, the sign that you saw. Yes. This is a great artist who um, created a font that allows you to do both male and female forms. Uh, so you see it's, it, you can either read this font as Bukhim Abaim, Bukhot Abaot. Uh, I love that. Yeah, and it's it's a continuation. There's a it's the same company that produced the font that is half Hebrew and half English, so that you can read a uh, sign that's both Hebrew and and uh, and Arabic. Um, so I'm giving you the um, extract of the Hebrew sidu. Um, so, for instance, what you see here. Um, I just want to tell you that in the discussions in, uh, in the Israeli Rabbinic Council, which is uh, Maram, we had fierce um, 
discussions on how we um, how we t speak about God or the divine. Um, and the solution that was agreed upon or that was voted upon at least was that most of the gendered language in terms of the divine in our sudul is male. But I brought you some of the examples that are not. Um, people were not ready to say that we're going to use a female form for God in the main um, in the main writing of the Sidul. But you see here, uh, this is the Shacharit for, for every day, and you see that there's a uh, female form and ma male form and female form for the person who's praying, Mudeh Muda. And this is the traditional prayer. Um, and this, these are variations uh, um, for uh, speaking about the divine in uh, in female form and in female values or attributes uh, like mother, like fountain, like spirit, um, creator, um, and so on. Uh, these are the morning prayers, um, which were written by uh, Rabbi Levi Kelman, who is also a good friend of CBSD. Uh, and here you see that they've tried to introduce female language and in the first versions there was much more female language about God uh, but that was too controversial and they have it a little bit so some of it is the standard prayer that you know and here it's Mikol Chayenu which is uh, um, female Eina Chaim which is spring which is female uh, spirit so the, the, the agreement the way we were able to agree was to speak about um, uh, was to introduce uh, female uh, language for God in in small ways to see if the communities can adjust to that uh, uh, for the future to have much broader use of uh, female God in in our in our liturgy. Great, thank you so much. And this is just skimming the surface. So let's take some time for a couple of questions. I want to say that when I started going to Israel in the eighties. Um, and was hanging around in the queer community there. Of course, it wasn't called queer then. In the, when uh, CBSC's first trip to Israel was when the uh, Jerusalem Open House was just beginning. And I had never heard gay men talking to each other in Hebrew. They were usually using female um, uh, language towards each other, which, I th which was the kind of the similar thing to way that gay men here in the United States would call each other Mary or something like that. But in gendered language, it's really obvious. Yeah. And you wouldn't hear that outside of just gay men talking to each other. And that was the 80s. Um, and that was really interesting for me to just be around and to hear how language would and, and it's And it still happens in, in, some, of the, in some of the gay circles. I think it happens uh, less in, uh, with younger, uh, yeah. LGBT people. Yeah. Right. It's def definitely, I think it's probably a generational thing. All right. So let's have a couple of questions. Um, would you also talk about the issue about some of the ways and also, uh, feminism has affected Hebrew language like Bali and how you refer to my, like how even a straight person would call their husband or their wife? What do people say now, or is it changing for everybody, or just for? It is. It um, is. So, so, so the word for husband and in, in Hebrew is ba'ali, which means my owner. Um, uh, and actually, there are letters from the from Shai Agron and from David Ben Gurion who tried to change it, but colloquially it did not work. So people in the '40s were begin were saying that this is a language that's not fitting modern times. Uh, but we're seeing more and more that, pe that people are referred to their male uh, partners as Benzugi, my partner, or Ishi, my man. Um, and that's becoming more and more, more common in feminist circles. Okay, so let's take a couple of questions. Um, all right, we have a couple of questions here about Somebody wants to know how, so how would you address people to say you without assuming a gender? Uh, I, we, you can't, you can't. You can't. Um, so the way 
Um, if I want to ask somebody, I would say, what pronoun should I use uh, so that's the right way to do it? Or what's the pronoun? Uh, but, but it's weird. I mean, it's not, the, it's not the natural way to speak, but that's the right way to do it in order not to assume anybody's pronoun. And I, would, I wanna say that along the lines of what Noah is saying about going into the future rather than staying in the present, we do that for our Torah reading at CBST. The traditional way of calling somebody up to the Torah is to say um, ta'amod, which is automatically puts it into uh, gendered. And so we've switched it at CBST. We say ekra, which and so we're call. I am calling up to the Torah, which is again saying I am in the future tense. Or as we've talked here, more per, in biblical Hebrew, it's called imperfect tense. There's no future past in biblical Hebrew. It's a different. It's the imperfect versus the perfect tense. So we say it at CBST for liturgical reasons. We say ekra la Torah so that we don't have to uh, identify somebody. And then we have the option that people don't have to use Ben or Bat, son or daughter in their name. They could say me bait. So I, we could say my name from the house of with parents' names. So you don't have to say son or daughter. Now, not everybody wants to be non-binary. So we leave the option. Some people want to remain firmly identified as masculine or feminine, including trans folks. So we have the option, Ben, Bat, or me bait for people who reject binary totally. So that's a liturgical, and people are really trying to figure these things out. Uh, CBSC has been doing this for many, 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 many years. So other questions? Harold, will you help me just look through? There's a... Um... Uh, Shep has his hand up. Uh, I just oh, yes, wanted to say is. that, Rabbi, I had the same experience when I went to Israel in the 70s. I, I met a bunch of gay guys, and they kept on referring to each other as he. Of course, I'm English speaking, but they were saying she. It was very funny. Sarah Siegel. Thank you so much. This has been amazing. I, I wonder if you can offer some encouragement to people who are trying to become fluent in Hebrew uh, and, um, and, and might have the temptation to go, oh, God, forget it. You know, now it's too hard if I have to do all this. Uh, can you help us with that? I think Hebrew is so beautiful. Hebrew is the best thing about Israel. And I get that it's hard, but like the, the level of depth in every single verb, in every single phrase, and the way it's constructed, I hope it's worth it. And I'm there for you. If you have any questions, you can email me. Uh, I'm happy to, I'm happy to, to I, I think that with the technology today, what people who are starting to study Hebrew at, an older age should be looking for is not, I don't know if becoming fluent in Hebrew in the way that you need to be fluent in English or in, in is, is the goal. I think that an in-depth understanding of every, of, the, of, of which you can gain gradually of the, of the history of the, la the language, of the culture that's reflected in the language, of the many different influences on Hebrew and how they have um, uh, transformed Israeli society, maybe that's an easier goal and then you don't get so frustrated. Maybe you can look at it not as I'm not getting to the top of the mountain where I can speak Hebrew fluently, but I am having this great time by this fantastic rock that I'm picking up and seeing uh, the many layers of uh, that's underneath it. Thank you. Now, now I get Rabbi Kleinbaum why you said what you said about uh, Rabbi Satya. Yeah. And the thing about Hebrew also is that it's a language that is constantly, we remember it's only a hundred and something years old as a modern language, but it is constantly being reinvented and the, the escalation of the speed of its reinvention by having many of the young people isolated on army, in the army for those three years where slang becomes developed very quickly it's it's a very 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 productive language in a way that I think English is slower in its changing as much as English changes and we're deeply influenced by change, Hebrew and it's a small language group so 
changes are uh, have very uh, very big impact. Uh, Rabbi Yael Carey, do you want to say anything about this? Uh, I don't know if you're up to it, but you're the one who used Elohima on your Facebook page. <laughs> And somebody no. asked, why didn't you say Elohot instead of Elohima? <laughs> no, I said everything. The, no, uh, where did you? Yeah, where did go ahead. Uh, Elohima come from? I, I actually don't know. It's uh, <laughs> uh, may, maybe no one knows. Uh, it's something that I just started hearing people saying, and I, uh, I loved it. So I started uh, using it as well. But of course, in Kabbalah, you know, you have Shekhinah, and you have Malchut, and... Uh, it's in Kabbalah, it's a very, um, the feminine power is very present. Beautiful. Yeah. So uh, how about, well, I think we have run out of time, uh, but what a fantastic class. And thank you all who came for the first time. And thank you to Rabbi Noah Satat for joining us. Rabbi Yael Kerry, who uh, and all the others who are here for the first time. And maybe we'll bring these folks back at different times for conversations about this. And um, it's so moving to be part of this study together. Rabbi, if I could just yes. do a little housekeeping. This session, as all our sessions, is being recorded. As soon as it goes up in the archives on our Facebook, I will note that. I have tried, uh, Rabbi Satat, to grab all of the things you've been saying. We have an email list that everyone's on. So we will be sending out an email. If there are any PDFs, links, PDFs, anything I'll we can send share. You, I'll send you to you. We would love also, to. Know. I think we should, I think, um, no, are you on our, did I invite you to our Facebook group? I might have, but that's oh, also okay. another way that you could post things on the Facebook group. I'll make sure you're on it and then you could post things and everybody can see it there uh, ongoing as well. All right, so shall we sing ourselves out? And by the way, if you want to be supportive of something fantastic that's going on in Israel and you want to do something to support the good guys that are making sure there's good things happening. Support the Israel Religious Action Center. You can make donations there. If you want to uh, thank Rabbi Noah Satat, that's a great way to do it. We got to support you. the progressive voices inside of Israel to make the change we want to see there. So do not give up on Israel, like we're not going to give up on this crazy country, and give money. They're suffering terribly because American Jews, the left has abandoned Israel, and the right wing is pouring in billions of dollars. So give money to the Israel Religious Action Center as one place that does fantastic work in fighting for equality and justice and the good guys. You can see this, Rabbi? Yeah. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm.
Wow, thank you, Adria. That's gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Noah, for joining us from Jerusalem. So we hope to see you there sometime very soon. Please, God. All right, everybody, thank you. And all those guests who came for the first time today for this discussion, so happy that you joined us. Bye-bye, everybody. Miss. <laughs>